More than 40 years in the making, the slavery reparations bill, known as H.R. 40, is making its way to the House floor. But the historic measure faces an uphill battle in the gridlock Senate. The disagreement within the black community regarding reparations crystallized on Juneteenth, 2019, when a House Judiciary Subcommittee held a hearing on the bill. The voice leading the charge against reparations on that day was Coleman Hughes, as he called the bill a moral and political mistake. Black people don't need another apology. We need safer neighborhoods and better schools. We need a less punitive criminal justice system. We need affordable health care. And none of these things can be achieved through reparations for slavery. And the obligation of citizenship is not transactional. It's not contingent on ancestry. It never expires and it can't be paid off. For all these reasons, Bill H.R. 40 is a moral and political mistake. Thank you. Joining me now is Coleman Hughes. He's the host of Conversations with Coleman. It's a podcast that he hosts. Coleman, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, let's get started right away with this question of uh, opposing the idea of reparations. You, you talk about it as a moral uh, mistake as well as a political mistake. What's the moral mistake here? The moral mistake is that obviously when the victims of a historical crime are still alive, there is a moral obligation of the perpetrators to pay reparations. When we're talking about, so for, for instance, it would, it would be a morally necessary, in my opinion, as I said at, at the hearing, to pay reparations for Jim Crow to survivors of the Jim Crow system. Now, on the other hand, when you're talking about the, the median black American being around, you know, 35 years old or so, born in the 80s, is there a moral obligation to take money from one group of people and give it to that person for a crime that happened 200 years ago? That's a very different situation and one in which you have to consider whether it's politically wise to do that, whether it actually serves the interests of the community that is suffering from many different problems in the present that need to be solved to frame that solution as reparations saying essentially blaming a group a group of people that don't feel connected to the crime because it was so long ago right so that's what i mean by a moral and political mistake so there, there's a few leaps there that I, that I want to unpack with you for a minute so you start by saying that there is it would be a morally proper thing to do if the victims of a crime were still alive and then when we get to these people born in the 1980s, you're saying, well, if the redress comes through them, if we give it to their great, great, great grandchildren, it produces a political sort of challenge and crisis for the, for the community, if I understand you correctly. The, and it may not be the proper way to address the needs of the broader community. Understood. I, I hear that argument. That still doesn't address why it would be not moral to do so, right? If, if for example, there were a, uh, a person who was enslaved and the, slavery ends and they have a child, just one generation, just a child uh, who was denied access to housing, health care and, and, and general American prosperity because their parent was a slave, an enslaved African. Would you just in that example, would you say that it would be improper to give reparations to them? Yeah, so that I, I'm not I think in that case probably it would be proper and obviously it's it's a case by case basis but the closer you are to the crime the more plausible and morally required it is to give somebody reparations and and you you always have to take into account the the other side of the equation here right if if my grandfather does something to to uh if if your grandfather did something horrible to to my grandfather i couldn't necessarily come to you and expect you to pay me directly right that would be immoral so that so obviously the closer you are to the crime, you're, you're exactly right. The more necessary, the more morally required it is. And it's a, it's a damn shame that reparations were not paid to recently freed slaves and their children. Unfortunately, it is a different situation we're dealing with today. And you can't, it's not the, just because reparations were due and never paid for a historical crime does not necessarily mean that the great, great grandchildren say, can demand of the great great grandchildren of the perpetrators that you pay me now. Uh, it, it's tragic, but a multiracial society 
with with a history like we do cannot survive if the principle we're gonna we're gonna abide by is we're not only solving our crimes but we're trying to solve all of the crimes of history and litigate the yeah. the oppression that has gone on this in this country in the present so so two things one the, the reason i was making that point about the, the the one generation is because then you're not actually rejecting the idea of paying future generations as such you're simply saying we have to it's about the level of proximity to the harm that was done what reparations advocates have been doing since the end of slavery is demonstrating the proximity of the harm. That means that whether it's 1865 or 1965 or 2020, there is considerable empirical data to show that slavery, the cost of slavery, the price of slavery, the impact of slavery continues to be felt by black people. And so while there may be a greater generational gap in terms of education, housing, health care, etc., we still see a considerable uh, relationship between the harm and the violence of slavery and the impact it's had on multiple generations. And then the second thing you say, and I want you to respond to both of these, I wanna give you space to respond to both of these, is this idea that we are somehow going to the grandchildren of people who were harmed and saying, we're gonna take care of it by going to the grandchildren of people who did the harm. That frames, this as, that, that frames reparations as this idea of going to white people and asking them to give money to black people. The idea of reparations is not that. That's not the claim made by anybody who's advocating for reparations. That's not the demand, that's not the request, and that's not the analysis that's being offered. The idea here is that the institutions that, that were created out of slavery, <clears throat> whether it's the insurance industry, whether it's the banking industry, whether it's uh, certain railroad companies, or whether uh, it is uh, uni many universities, all of these things were born out of the institution and the violence and the, and, and the crisis of slavery. And those, things can, those institutions continue to live, they continue to thrive, and they continue to reproduce inequality. And so the idea here is not to go hat in hand to random white people and give their money to random black people. It's to analyze a system that has given power and privilege to those institutions and also that has created a gap in opportunity between black folk and white folk. And the demand and the ask that's being made is of the institution, it's of the very government who, which was built on the exploited labor of enslaved African people. And so I, I, I would reject the characterization of reparations as, as you do and rather see this as a way of, as we quite literally analyze it as, repairing the damage that was done. That's the idea here. Okay, so two, two points uh, to respond to there. The first is the idea that, yes, slavery was technically long ago in terms of years, but the harm has persisted and that that can be shown in empirical data so i think i think it's a lot more complicated than that and listen i know this is not a popular opinion but my my ancestors were slaves in this country um as most black peoples were and i think there is the there is a degree to which people born today are appropriating the struggles of our ancestors and and you know if you think about it a consider, for instance, hypothetically, a Jewish person born in the 90s. To what extent does the Holocaust impact him? If he's going to go around and say that he's struggling because of the Holocaust, I think a lot of people would be very skeptical of that. They would say, maybe, maybe your parents, maybe your grandparents, but there's a certain amount of removal from, in, in years from the crime that makes those kinds of claims less plausible. And, and that's, that's just my opinion. I, I understand that that's controversial, but I don't see how it's not true. And then on the second, well, on the second point. Okay, can I pause you on the first one just for clarity, and then I want you, yeah, I'll give you space sure. to answer the second one. Um, the, the, on the first one, as a matter of fact, let, let's, let's do this. Uh, let's pause and take a commercial. The thing I had planned to do next, I'm not going to do. This is also for my producers. I'm going to come back, and we're going to talk about those two points you just made. All right, everybody stay with me. We got much more coming up. Coleman Hughes here on Black News Tonight. Welcome back to Black News Tonight. I'm continuing my conversation with Coleman Hughes. We're talking about reparations and whether they are both morally necessary and hopefully in, in this last bit, we'll talk a little bit about uh, whether they're politically viable. Uh, this idea though that black people are far enough away from the damage of it that it's no longer a reasonable complaint or a reasonable critique of the system to say that 
that, that slavery or, or the impact of slavery uh, it still lingers today. Again, that, that seems, no, that is contradicted by the facts on the ground. There is a direct relationship between mass incarceration. If we look at the pattern from from the end of slavery to uh, the to the liberation, the emancipation of slaves, to the creation of uh, black codes, to the creation of the convict lease system, to the creation of the modern prison industrial complex, to the creation of laws to, to fortify and fill the prisons, we see direct correlations, just as one example, between slavery and, and mass incarceration, and that has turned into a systemic problem. When you look at things like that, it seems hard to say that there's no connection between the slavery and um, and 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 what we're dealing with today. But I guess my question for you is, if you if you knew, if we could empirically determine and persuade you that reparations, or, or, I'm sorry, if I could persuade you that slavery had a direct impact on the lives of black people today and the prosperity chances of black people today, would you then be pro reparations? That's a good question. Uh, so I think. Obviously, the, the past influences the present in all kinds of complicated ways. I'm not denying that that's true. What I am saying is that when you look at the specifics, usually slavery gets blamed for things that, are off, that often had nothing to do with slavery. So you mentioned mass incarceration. I would have to disagree. I mean, mass incarceration was a phenomenon that started in the late 70s. Before the late 70s, there was no mass incarceration. And, and it, it, it happened for complicated reasons relating to you know bad incentives on the part of prosecutors tough on crime laws there's a lot of people still alive today that are to blame for mass incarceration we can't just blame the legacy of slavery there are there are people to be held accountable and i do think this is one way in which the the simplistic sort of blaming everything on slavery in a weird way actually lets a lot of politicians that are doing bad things right now off of the hook so that's just one example to give here. And then to your second question of, if you could persuade me that there is, I, I, th I think there's no doubt that slavery has had some impact. It, it's really hard to, to say how much and everyone's individual family story of coming out of slavery into, into the present is unique and how different families dealt with it. It's very hard to paint with a broad brush about the extent to which any given person's life trajectory in the present was influenced by slavery. That's a very complicated question. Well, but that's why we're but, offering systemic analysis, right? That's what we're saying. It's not about the individual uh, case. It's saying that there are structural uh, factors and structural determinants here, that, that, that the reality of black folk writ large is affected by this. But, but just to be clear, and for time's sake, if I'm understanding you correctly, there actually is no amount of correlation that you would find persuasive enough to, um, to support reparations. It's not as if, if you knew that black people's lives were directly impacted by this, you still would say no to reparations. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I would because I would, because even, even if you admit slavery is the root source of the problem, that doesn't imply necessarily that reparations is going to solve those problems. That's actually, that's actually a fallacy. Um, so, so for example, if, if reparations were paid today, tomorrow we would still be living in a country, I would argue, that has you know unsafe neighborhoods dysfunctional public schools poor health care all the problems related to poverty would still exist and we would be left saying well whether they were caused by slavery or not let's be solution oriented what does it mean to be problem solvers here right rather than to be stuck in the past in this this kind of this quixotic quest to have some kind of moral absolution right some some closure that is, in my view, not practical, not in the cards, and not going to do anything to solve the, the, the kinds of issues people are waking up with every day. So, so there's a few things. There. I mean, it, it, it sounds like you're saying that reparations wouldn't stop or wouldn't fix many of the other problems we have in society. That seems like no, not exactly. an odd argument. Yes. It, well, it, I mean, it, it, I wouldn't hear you. Even, so, so it wouldn't even it wouldn't even fix the problem that it's alleged to fix, which is to sort of heal America's soul on the issue of slavery. I don't even think it would do that, let alone solve any of the problems. But that's not that what's alleged. People that, are actually. But but but, but hold, hold on, that's fair. But, but Coleman, that's not what's being argued here, right? The, the reparations movement is not saying give black people reparations to heal America's soul. I'm not particularly interested in America's soul. I'm interested in my pockets. I'm interested in my community. I'm interested in creating the capacity for black 
uh, wealth for black institutions. And that, so this isn't some abstract moral project for America or fight for America's soul. I would argue America ain't got one. The, 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 the real issue here is, will this be a proper form of redress? If you take my money and I ask for it back, and you say, well, I would give your money back, but you're just going to spend it poorly anywhere. You're still going to be broke after I give it back. That's not, a, that's not a persuasive argument for not giving me what's mine. The argument for reparations is that it's owed to us. This isn't an act of, of philanthropy or largesse. This isn't a favor. This is what is owed. And then after you give us what we owe, we will have the capacity to do what is uh what, 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 is, what is best for our community. We have the opportunity to institution build, to produce intergenerational wealth, not in some sort of narrow capitalist way, but the idea that we can at least support one another, that we can, that we can build things for ourselves. And in doing so, that doesn't mean that we forfeit our citizenship. It doesn't mean that we're not still supposed to get safer neighborhoods. It doesn't mean that we're not supposed to get housing and health care. White people get that without reparations, right? It, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't get high quality schools. White people get that without reparations. The idea here is that reparations is to make us whole again, right? Or to at least attempt to repair the damage done. And you're right, maybe nothing will be complete. But the fact that it isn't perfect doesn't mean it shouldn't be done at all. I'm going to give you the last word, too. I want to make sure you have an opportunity to respond to all of this. Um, and, and, but the, and the other piece of this is you say that it's not viable. It seems to me that reparations uh, has never been more viable. It's, it's never seemed more likely than it does right now. The, it, it, whether it's H.R. 40 advancing, whether it's people not just considering whether to study slavery, but to actually examine particular proposals about it, uh, whether we're talking about the fact that mainstream politicians are talking about this, you've written about it, and I know you have some critique of it, but there, it, it's a conversation that didn't happen 20 years ago. So it seems to me that we're right on the precipice of something major. Um, but I want to give you, uh, I have literally one minute left, and I want to give it to you to offer your response. Sure. So let's be very concrete. A few months ago, you maybe you covered this on your show, but the mayor of Oakland uh, announced a program to give $500 a month to low-income black families. Right, and not low-income white families. My, my critique of that program is, yes, obviously we have to find ways beyond just giving cash, but improving the true drivers of wealth, which is not disposable income, but human capital and knowledge and, and skills and so forth. We have to find ways of addressing those issues for America's poor of all colors, right? But what does it mean for a, a, a multiracial, diverse country going into the future with the idea that we can have policies that are only for certain people based on skin color and an ancestry and not, not actually based on class, poverty, and wealth, right? Because if, if that's the problem we're trying to solve, and I think we would both agree, at least that, that is certainly a big problem, right? Poverty is... is, is well, is really at the root of what we're talking about here, poverty and dysfunction and opportunity and wealth, then why not just base our policies on that? It, it's, it's, it more effectively targets disadvantage for people of all colors. It is less politically divisive because nobody feels blamed. Nobody feels like they're being blamed for things that happened hundreds of years ago. It's more sustainable, it's more popular, and it's more ethical. So to me, I'm comparing reparations to a policy that is class-based and seeing that it is just wanting in many ways by comparison. 